Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you all today for our conversation about our new book series on religion and sustainable development goals. I also would like to thank the Berkeley Center for this wonderful opportunity. It is such a pleasure and privilege to be here with you all today to share our new series, Religion Matters, on the significance of religion in global issues. And we have a wonderful group of panelists who will be introducing the volumes they co-authored. My name is Aisha Kadeche Oreyana, and I'm a research affiliate and uh, adjunct professor at Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. I would like to set the stage by introducing our volume and share with you um, the background. Our series, Religion Matters on the Significance of Religion in Global Issues, examines the role of religion in current challenges our global community faces by using the 17 Sustainable Development Goals as its overarching framework. It is thoroughly interreligious, interdisciplinary, and international in its outlook and approach. Its volumes are written by and for academics, practitioners, and policymakers by teams of two to four authors representing different religious, different disciplines and contexts. Through both theory and case studies, our series combines cutting edge research with real life examples and concrete recommendations. We also aim to publish each volume in both print and open access formats. Our series was born out of a great vision and out of deep dissatisfaction. The vision was already cast by the international community in 2015 when 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs for short, were brought forth. This great vision of a more just, more peaceful world has inspired countless people, including my colleagues and me, coming from different countries, different faith traditions, and different disciplines. Our dissatisfaction, however, resulted from our observation that most of the studies and main spheres of engagement stayed within our own communities and disciplines. We have come to the realization that what we need are more bridges. Bridges between different disciplines, bridges between different faith traditions, and bridges between different spheres of engagement. We need to build bridges between academics, policymakers, and practitioners. We need to understand what problems each of us face and what potentials and insights each of us bring to solving global challenges. Global issues as addressed in the SDGs, such as conflict, hunger, climate change, are far too complex to be solved alone. No one discipline, no one faith tradition, and no one sphere of engagement can do it alone. It is in the combination of our efforts that the potential for change is the greatest. Our series is carried by one more conviction, that is religion matters. For countless people around the globe, religion is a major force that impacts and shapes how they think and how they act or don't act. However, the role of religion and its connection to SDGs are still not well studied or understood. And the secularization thesis compounded by the post enlightenment paradigm continues to relegate religion to the private realm. Yet secularization thesis is not holding up and recent years have seen the beginning of a paradigm change. Max Weber's disenchantment of the world is giving way to a new interest in the role of religion in shaping social processes. Empirical research supports this turn. So religion matters, yet how exactly does it matter? What are religion's potentials and problems? It is the aim of this new series to draw out the ambivalent nature of religion in different global issues. So our series, Religion Matters, provides short and accessible volumes that analyze the role of religion with its problems and potentials in different challenges that we as the world community face today. We are interreligious, interdisciplinary, and we build bridges between different spheres of engagement. So today we'll be talking about the uh, first four, four volumes that came out of this series. 
Other upcoming volumes include Religion and Human Rights, Religion and Experiences of Disability, Religion in SDGs, which will be an introductory volume. We also have a partnership with Religions for Peace for five volumes, and these will include Religion and Peace, Religion and Education, Religion and Gender, Religion and Environment, and Religion and Freedom of Thought and Conscience. And we are always looking for new topics and authors. So if you have an idea for a volume, please let us know. Now, before I move to introduce our first panelist, uh, I have a few reminders. So this webinar is being recorded and the captioned video will be posted to the event page on the Berkeley Center's website soon. If you registered for today's event, you will also receive an email with the captioned video when it becomes available. Also, the last 15 to 20 minutes, we will answer questions from the audience. So please join the conversation by opening the question and answer box at the bottom of the Zoom screen and type your question. Now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our first panelist, Christine Schlister. Christine is a senior lecturer at Zurich University and a research fellow at Stellenbosch University. Her research interests include public theology, peace and reconciliation studies, and the theology and ethics of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. She is a co-author of The Significance of Religion in Conflict and Resolution. Christine, all yours. Thanks very much, Aisha. And thank you, Berkeley Center, for organizing this event. It is wonderful to be here with all of you today, if only virtually. I'm also pleased that our third editor, our dear colleague, Professor Pauline Kollontai from York St. John's University is able to join us and to supplement my own remarks that come from the perspective of Christian theology and ethics by her own Jewish viewpoint, just as Aisha brings in her Muslim perspective. In our joint volume on the role of religion in conflict and conflict resolution, we develop a theoretical framework for the analysis not only of the destructive sites of religion in furthering hatred and violence, but also of the constructive sites of religion and religion's powerful resources for peace and reconciliation that are oftentimes overlooked. We then test the usefulness of this methodological framework in three case studies from different geographical regions and different faith traditions. While Pauline looks at the role of Judaism in Israel's land rights conflicts, Aisha explores Muslim women's peacemaking in Pakistan. I focus on the role of the Christian tradition in pre and post genocide Rwanda. In the next few minutes, I will briefly introduce our methodological framework and then discuss the findings of my own case study in Rwanda. For questions concerning Israel or Pakistan, I would like to refer you to my two colleagues. In our analysis of the role of religion in different conflict settings, my colleagues and I built on the work of religion sociologist Richard Friedley, mediation expert Owen Fraser and conflict resolution expert Mark Owen. We identify seven dimensions of religion that might become relevant in a conflict setting, namely religion as religiouscape, religion as community, as a set of teachings, spirituality, practice, institutions, and religion as framework. 
religion in conflict, pre-genocide and genocide Rwanda. The ambivalence of religion comes out clearly in the case study of Rwanda. Rwanda, a small country in Eastern Africa, jumped to international attention when the fastest genocide of recent history took place in 1994. Within mere 100 days, up to 1 million people were killed. Most victims were Tutsi, a minority of about 15%, but countless moderate Hutu were murdered as well. So what did religion have to do with this? At the times of the genocide, Rwanda was and still is a predominantly Christian country. In my fieldwork and research, I have identified four aspects of religion that played a role in leading up to the genocide. First, religion as community, religious versus ethnic identities and relationships. The church, which meant mostly the Catholic Church in pre-genocide Rwanda, joined with the colonial powers in their policy of divide and rule. Rather than confronting the underlying rivalry between Hutu and Tutsi, the church supported ethnic divisions. Religion as a set of teachings, problematic theology. In their teachings, the church emphasized obedience or submission to authority and neglected other important Christian concepts such as responsibility, freedom, or the prophetic witness to speak truth to power. Then, religion as framework, language, cultural myths, and Weltanschauung. Not only was Christian language instrumentalized for political purposes, the churches failed to address the cultural violence that Rwandan myths and Weltanschauung were saturated with. And fourth, religion as an institution, church-state relations, the construction of hegemony and power struggles. The church and state relationships in pre-genocide Rwanda were entangled and lacked critical distance. These four factors helped to contribute an atmosphere in which finally a genocide was possible. At the same time, however, and I do not want to uh, neglect mentioning it, there were countless voices that spoke out for peace and reconciliation and continue to do so. Religion in reconciliation post-genocide Rwanda. Contrary to my own context in Switzerland and to many other secular Western European countries, the churches are significant actors in Rwandan civil society. This also holds true for the current national politics of reconciliation implemented by the government after the genocide. The churches seek to supplement the government's top-down processes through various bottom-up initiatives. In our analysis of the different case studies in different contexts, my colleagues and I identified a variety of factors that can help to get a clearer picture of the constructive resources that faith actors can bring to the field of conflict transformation and reconciliation. These characteristics can be grouped along formal and material lines, even though the category boundaries can be fuzzy. And needless to say, context sensitivity is key, along with an awareness of the vast diversity of faith actors. 
In view of post-genocide Rwanda, I found that faith actors are engaging in processes of reconciliation by utilizing the following resources. Trust. Trust and moral credibility of the churches had been seriously harmed through the genocide. For trust to grow again, guilt had to be confessed and repented rather than ignored or denied. In 1996, Christians from different denominations drafted the so-called Detmold Confession, in which representatives of Hutu, Tutsi, and the West acknowledged their guilt and asked for forgiveness and thus helped to pave a path towards the future. Second, relationships and identity. Different from many government initiatives, faith actors invest in long-term relationships on the ground. Relationships with victims and with perpetrators. Service delivery, as in many other African contexts and beyond, the churches in Rwanda provide a number of community services, including education, medical services, orphanages, and so on. Normative concepts and values. Christian concepts such as forgiveness, reconciliation, love, grace, do make a difference, especially when confronted with messages of revenge or hatred. And one final point, something that could be called a holistic perspective. I found that oftentimes faith actors combine initiatives for reconciliation with development projects, thereby nurturing both body and soul. One example is the Cows for Peace project, where a pair of perpetrator and survivor receives a cow. By caring together for the cow and sharing the income generated by selling the milk, for example, both angles, reconciliation and development, are being strengthened. I would like to close my remarks by pointing out that next to these strong resources, some faith actors also endorse some problematic features, at least as I saw them from my outsider's perspective, including a too close church relationship, a one-sided understanding of reconciliation, and lack of attention to human rights. Thanks very much for your attention. I look forward to our discussion in the end and would like to hand over to my dear colleague, Philip McDonagh and his excellent volume on religion and diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Please allow me to introduce Philip McDonagh who is a senior fellow at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute of Maynooth University and a distinguished global fellow at the Center of Theological Inquiry at Princeton University. He previously served as Irish ambassador to India, the Holy See, Finland, Russia, and the OSCE. Thank you, Philip. Well, thank you very much, Aisha, and thank you, Christina. Um, just a at the present moment, I've um, started a new center, um, the Center for Religion, Human Values and International Relations at Dublin City University. And uh, with a number of friends, I'm trying to put into practice the messages of our book because we're working with the churches and other religions on the island of Ireland in developing shared policies or ideas on the economy and on Europe, which I can say more about perhaps in a moment. And I'd also like to emphasize that I was fortunate in working on this volume with three very good friends. It was very much a joint effort among the four of us. 
Now, as I was contemplating this uh, meeting, I asked myself, what are the points that I would like some of our, um, our friends to take away from the meeting? Because our book is quite detailed in many respects and it brings together many different strands of thinking. Um, so I came up with five points. Um, the first is that the Sustainable Development Goals teach us that we have arrived at a point of inflection in human history. As I'll say more about that in a moment. I think the second point is that in our view, the history of the next 20 to 30 years will depend to a great extent on our line of approach to international questions, what we call in the book, uh, our methodology and orientation. Thirdly, I'd like to emphasize a point that is present in the book, although we don't emphasize it particularly, but it's that a greater relevance uh, for religion in the global public debate is very good for the development of our religious faith. If we are people of faith, there are many ways in which this will, will benefit faith. Um, my fourth point, and now I'm getting a little bit more practical, concerns our frameworks of engagement. We can't get from A to B in international relations unless we have the right frameworks. I have spent many years of my uh, life working in different international frameworks, uh, the Northern Ireland Peace Process, the UN, uh, the OSCE and the European Union. And I've come away with this very strong conviction that you need to get the frameworks right. And finally, I will say just a few words about the current situation in Europe. Now, my first point about the point of inflection is something that is so widely accepted, I probably don't need to say much about it. It concerns the significance of the SDGs themselves as a universal project. Um, it concerns climate change, we now have to take account of um, the pandemic. Technology is raising all kinds of new challenges. For example, people talk about changing the nature of what it is to be human through interventions on the genome or artificial intelligence. The question of, of weapons hasn't gone away, both very large weapons and the massive spread of light weapons in populations. Um, and then of course, there are the cultural, uh, cultural and political challenges that we associate with uh, the social media, the internet, divided societies um, and so on. So we are at a point of inflection. I think we are we're forced to think more in a planetary sense than ever before. Now, my second point is that faced with this situation, we have to look very carefully at our methodology. I think that Avicenna um, said that what is not possible now can become possible if we take the right intermediate steps. I think Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that something new can be born that is not discernible in the alternatives of the present. And in our book, we, we approach this question of methodology in the light of the basic idea that institutions and procedures need to be underpinned by a cultural agenda. We have the concept of axioms of the historical imagination in our book. And this is really a vision of how change happens, which ought to be acceptable, we think, to people of all religious backgrounds, but also people whose worldview or life stance or position of conscience is not defined in religious terms as such. And we have to accommodate those who wish to speak the language of reason without taking a religious position. And just to give a couple of indications of what this cultural change could mean, it would mean, for example, changing our understanding of freedom. 
we have thought certainly in the Western world um, of freedom as choice, but we argue that it will be more and more essential to think of freedom as something that brings responsibility. Uh, we have to exercise our freedom in the light of some kind of shared public truth. Um, and similarly, reason, you know, reason has been drawn very much towards the camp of empirical science. But anyone who reads poetry or literature, um, quite apart from a religious cast of mind, will see that uh, we can reason about the human situation in a manner that doesn't come from the laboratory. So we need a broad scope of reason. And we need to see that something like trust on which politics depends cannot be constituted simply by a choice in the political arena. It's something we have to work on. And the question is, how do we work on building trust? My third point is about how this kind of engagement uh, of religion in public issues is good for our faith and good for our understanding of our faith. First of all, of course, very basically, um, we work together with people of other viewpoints. Um, I think what, what Christina said about Rwanda is a very good illustration of that. Uh, I think it may also enable us to change our understanding of leadership in a religious community. Um, it helps us to see that the pursuit of truth must be associated with actions. There has to be some coherence between what we say and what we do. And what we do somehow has to be rooted in our political world as well as in our personal lives. My, my fourth point is about frameworks. Um, and here, I think we have to give ourselves the possibility of managing the changes that are needed by having um, better frameworks. The jargon language is you know, making multilateralism fit for purpose. Now, this means, first of all, a question about the agendas. Some of the most important consequential issues for, for the future of humanity are dealt with in silos or not dealt with at all. And the interrelatedness of issues is lost. Christina spoke about the holistic view that a religious perspective can bring. But we need a holistic view of the international agenda in which it's possible to correlate one issue with another issue. We also need the right timescales. Very often our international meetings are organized in a bureaucratic spirit. There's a cycle of meetings from week to week or month to month or year to year, but we don't give ourselves the time for a serious transition. And I think the successful international negotiations of the 20th century had a long lead time. The Law of the Sea Conference or the Northern Ireland Peace Process in which I was involved or the negotiation of the Helsinki Final Act in the 1970s. And then we come to the question of participation in negotiations. Now, I'm a believer that governments ultimately have the responsibility, and in Europe that includes the community method for those of us who belong to the European Union. But we need bridges to other uh, spheres. As Aisha said in her introduction, we need bridges to civil society and business and media education, and of course, to religion. So the question of how to arrange all of that is a whole science in itself, which our center, our new center is trying to work on. And then there's the question of involving those who are powerless or relatively powerless, because this ought not to be a matter of some kind of top table. Um, and then there's the question of the product. What are we actually negotiating? And I think we have to look at the negotiation of principles, and we need to also look at confidence building measures in support of the goals that we're trying to achieve. And I come now to my conclusion, my last point, which is about Europe. A great deal could be said, 
but I would just observe that at the moment, the European Union is launched on a conference on the future of Europe, which is running from last May, two months ago, to uh, the first half of next year. And this is a huge consultation, which gives us an opportunity to get involved in different ways and at different levels. And I hope that beyond that conference, we will also look more systematically at the wider Europe, the Europe beyond the 27, and then look at how regional developments in Europe can set some kind of headline for a stronger regional approach in other parts of the world. So that uh, is all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Ruby Quanson Davis, our third panelist. Ruby is a development practitioner with over 18 years global experience in public policy research, dialogue, electoral politics, deliberative conversations and communications, citizens advocacy, community and international development. She was a long serving staff member of the Institute for Democratic Governance and a leading think tank in Ghana. Thank you so much, Ruby, all yours. Thank you so much, Aisha. And um, at the risk of uh, disowning my current employers, I should say that uh, I'm Senior Learning Advisor at Peace Direct, the, the peace building um, organization based in London. And I wanna thank my colleagues who went ahead and, and sort of situated this conversation within the right context um, that allows me to go straight into um, my conversation. And um, I guess uh, with, 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 the, uh, with, with the context provided, I will probably like um, um, Philip highlight just about four or five main things about our volume. Um, so this volume is, this, this, this um, book is focused on um, the significance of religion in deliberative democracy. And I want to acknowledge my two fabulous co-authors, um, Elizabeth Gish, who is um, at the Kettering Foundation in Ohio in the United States and um, previously on, um, in, on, on faculty at the um, Kentucky University. And my other colleague is Kuda Chitsike, who is a human rights lawyer based in Zimbabwe, and of course, um, myself. Um, so the, our theme is basically looking at the intersection between religion and deliberative democracy. And we're choosing that strand of, um, um, of democracy um, um, to focus on on, on what citizens do every day. And um, the notion of, um, of, of democracy that we're talking about is, is perhaps we're leaning more towards Benjamin Barber's notion of everyday citizens and what they do in democratic practices. Now, the, um, our chapter is suggesting making a few assumptions. Uh, um, and one of it is that um, religion can, find spaces in deliberative democracy as a way of engaging um, their the, uh, the, the, the members, followers, congregations, and as a way of um, engaging pressing social, political, economic issues in the world we live in. And this is where the sustainable development goals um, sort of is critical to, to the intersection of our work. Um, we, we recognize that, and I think you said it at the beginning, that to achieve these 17 goals, we're going to have to have some kind of cross-cutting collaborations. And so we see um, deliberative democracy as, as, as a space in which um, religion um, can, can advance some of these goals and also the goals of religion itself. Now, I just want to pause uh, to just highlight about two or three areas of intersection that is important to, to our book. And one is that we see both deliberation or deliberative democracy and religion as practices. And this does not at all exclude the other ways and senses in which we, one may see religion, such as belief, faith, and so on. But we see both as, 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 as um, elements that we need to practice in order to advance what we believe in. And this is one of the intersections that the book um, explores. The, the second 
um, intersection that's interesting to us is that deliberative democracy has a way of embracing, um, if you will, diversity, pluralism, uh, multiple voices. And some may say that religion doesn't always do that. But the point is religion is perhaps struggling with that. And, 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 and in many religions, there, there are efforts, even within the same religion, to draw people to conversation. We think deliberative democracy um, kind of offers that space. Similarly, we do think that religion provides a space for democratic practices to be advanced. And I will, I will talk about you know, that a little shortly, but the point, the, the reason that um, we believe so, especially with the cases that we want to showcase in this um, volume, is, is that there are so many regions in the world that uh, they still have people who live everyday lives within the context of their religious beliefs and practices. And so if countries uh, and, and, and nations and, and multilateral institutions want to talk about development and they want to talk about addressing the challenges that the world faces, where else to do that than the places where the majority of those populations are found? Now, I should say that this doesn't apply to every part of the world, but for the regions that we're showing in this book, um, you would find that it is important for um, some interaction to occur between um, religion and, and all other efforts that are geared towards development. And um, I, should, I should also mention um, upfront that at this point, we do not position religion as, as um, you know, a, a faultless notion. We do acknowledge the ambivalence of religion. Similarly, we do not project democracy or deliberative democracy for that matter as a panacea in all of, of the problems of the world. Um, but the point is that um, we do see um, deliberation as one of the ways in which religious groups and institutions can engage on critical social, political, economic, sociocultural issues, all of it as embodied in the SDGs. Um, and therefore there is something to explore over there. We, we find a certain uniqueness in that intersection. Now, of course, there have been so many books and, and, and you know, amazing thoughts shared on um, religion and democracy, faith and democracy, and, uh, and those are not at all dismissed. But often when we talk about religion in democracy, there is the sense of you know, the, the, the problem of religion. Is, is it okay to bring your faith into a conversation on democracy and where democracy is seen as a terrain of the secular? And so um, this is, this is a, not exactly the preoccupation of this book. The point is that there are spaces um, in religious, among religious institutions and in what deliberative democracy offers um, for reinforcement and advancement of development goals. Um, and, and so those are sort of like the, the three uh, main intersections for us in this book. Conceptually, we, we think about um, this book um, as, as one that promotes collaboration. And this is why SDG 17 is important to us. Um, the recognition that development, the development agenda of the world is not gonna be realized unless different institutions, groups, individuals are on board and forms the foundation of the way that this volume is structured. And so we, um, we, we, we hang on the notion of co-production popularized by um, economist Elena Ostrom on the fact that institutions need to see citizens as producers. And citizens in all forms of shapes and shapes and wherever they find themselves, there is room for co-production, for co-creation. And so our book is anchored on that. And um, we also kind of underscore the multi-sectoral approach to development in, in, in this book. So in my final minutes, I'm just gonna highlight um, a little bit about the, the, the four chapters we have in this volume. Uh, and, and obviously the first one, we look at that intersection between religion and deliberative democracy as practices. And we see them as practices that literally need to be practiced for people to get into the habit of engaging, of talking, of making decisions, of weighing the options and so on. In our second chapter, we, we throw a gender lens 
on this theme. We look at um, the intersection between um, religion and, and, and deliberative democracy through um, a gender lens. And my co-author, Kuda, does an amazing work of bringing in um, gender violence in Zimbabwe um, into in, as, as a lens through which we see how religious groups um, interact um, when, when, the, when, when the issue is, is, is obviously could be gender disaggregated. The third one, um, um, which I lead on, would be looking at the notion of um, a concept in, in Ghanaian parlance, which says Jai Maninka, let it be, which in English kind of sounds as if, you know, the notion of forgiveness, and this is the closest we get to what it means in religion. Now we want to examine that to say, is this the best way of, 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 of solving problems? Are there ways in which spaces could be provided within religious groups for people to air and, and work through their challenges and, 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 and be, be active citizens of their communities rather than just being told to let it go and to leave it. And then the fourth chapter, we look at the, um, the church and philanthropy. We look at ways in which decisions are made. So um, all in all, our, our, our volume is sort of the how volume. How, how do people engage religion? And we propose deliberative democracy as the approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruby. Now I turn to Elizabeth Leroux, who's our last panelist. Elizabeth is a research director at the Unit for Religion and Development Research at Stellenbosch University. As a faith and development expert, she does research across the globe, focusing particularly on gender and gender-based violence, as well as faith communities in conflict-affected settings, patriarchy within faith communities, and interfaith peace and conflict. Elizabeth, all yours. Thank you for the introduction um, and, and the opportunity to speak and tell you a bit about the book that Sandra and I are working on. Um, the one we're busy writing, and we're writing on it as we speak, um, is about the relevance of religion to SDG 5 as we focus on violence against women and girls. I'm co-authoring the book with Sandra Pertek, um, and, and as I'm saying, we're busy writing it, so to speak about it today as though it's a done deal, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm taunting the gods a bit. But thank you for the opportunity to tell you a bit more about what we're doing, what we have in mind, and what we're exploring in our volume. Um, so I think a bit of background about myself and my co-author will help you understand the specific focus and approach of our volume. Um, I'm research director at the Unit for Religion and Development Research at Sandwich University in South Africa. And what we do and what I do is empirical research in various countries across the globe um, with and for development organizations, faith-based organizations, governments, um, focusing on the role of religion and religious actors and religious organizations in violence and, and then specifically violence against women and girls. So in writing this volume, I'm drawing on what I've learned in, in, in the research in various countries, focusing on various aspects of violence against women and girls. Um, and, and, and in the empirical work that I draw on, I'm focusing on, on six specific countries and in, in, in different, uh, six specific studies in different countries. Now, uh, my co-author, Sandra Patek, is a researcher at the Cerida Project at the University of Birmingham in the UK. And she's a gender practitioner international development. And her, her research focuses around the intersections between GBV and religion and forced migration and development. Um, and, and in our volume, she explores religious inequalities within socially constructed faith traditions. And she draws on her PhD work in Turkey and Tunisia with forced migrant women. Um, but also before she joined academia uh, full time, she was a senior gender advisor for um, Islamic Relief Worldwide. And, and she's also drawing on her experience as a practitioner working in various countries across the world. So um, with that background, I hope the link in our volume between academia and research and praxis, on the other hand, um, on the other side of the you know, that link for us is, is very important. Um, for both of us, our research has always, always been 
with and for practitioners, not an academic exercise per se. So, uh, you know, like it, it, it's a much needed exercise investigation on how to design and implement VORG, Violence Against Women and Girls uh, Prevention Programming. So that's the approach that we bring to, to writing this, this volume as well. So that being said, um, let me tell you a bit more about what we're writing on. Um, so aware of the very real impact religious beliefs have on the lives and safety of women and girls, this volume prioritizes experiences and learnings from empirical research um, and of practitioners and their activities at grassroots level to better understand the nature and the root causes of violence against women and girls. And as such, in doing this, we're uniting um, the perspectives of two different faith traditions, Christianity and Islam. So I'm writing on a Christian perspective, Sandra's writing from an Islamic perspective, and it's both an analytical and a practical exploration of how religion matters in women and girls' vulnerability and safety. Um, so while my empirical chapters, the ones that I'm responsible for, draw on, on research done in Christian communities and in Christian settings, and Sandra's draw, draws on research done in Islamic communities in Muslim settings, um, we threw out our volume consistently pause to then reflect on what these religion-specific empirical research if from these different settings if we bring that together if we bring that into conversation what does that mean for our understanding of the role of religion in general in violence against women and girls so um we we throughout have these synthesis chapters where we where we um converse between the different settings and the findings from the different settings um so it a key aim for us in our volume is to explore both sides of what I often call the double-edged sword of, of religion. Um, because while religion can be a wonderful and, and much needed and is a wonderful and much needed resource in addressing and ending and preventing violence against women and girls, unfortunately, it really does also contribute to violence against women and girls. And what is of critical importance to us in this volume is to be fully honest and transparent in discussing both sides. Um, very often we see that, that, that um, only one side is discussed and, and, and we, we, we're trying to bring that balance and looking at both sides and saying, okay, what does this mean for development practice? Um, so we do this through engagement with empirical research done in different countries and contexts, but all of these settings are ones with high religiosity and fragility. Um, so that's Zambia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, South Africa, Tunisia, Turkey, Ethiopia, Liberia, and Colombia. And we're bringing that together in this exploration of identifying and, and, and unpacking both sides. Um, so the exploration is constantly guided by this need not to, this need to do thorough analysis, but, but also for it to have practical applicability. So it's, it's the empirical exploration combined with theoretical reflection that's constantly in conversation with what it means to practitioners and policymakers and their potential engagement with religion and religious actors around violence against women and girls. Um, so as I said, to honestly really reflect on both sides, um, and the reason why we feel this is important to look at both the good and the bad of religion in violence against women and girls is because um, much of the engagement that we currently see around religion and violence against women and girls is either a simplistic condemnation of religion or, or outright religious advocacy. It's, it's very often like this very simplistic binary and you kind of have to pick a side. And we want to bring that more into conversation for a nuanced discussion of both sides. Um, that, that's in, and, and, and the fact that we're engaging with both Christianity and Islam, I think really enriches this reflection. And, and as I said, that was for us, as 
the key objective of, of this book. Um, the second key of objective is to offer more than a theoretical reflection um, and, and, and being grounded in empirical research in various re uh, regions and countries, um, and with many of the studies being on practical intervention. So lots of the research that we're drawing on was, uh, was done on uh, violence against women and girls interventions that were being implemented by various development organizations. So by, by keeping that, that groundedness in practice in what development practitioners are doing, um, the volume ensures that the world of practice is accounted for and reflected in an academically robust way. And in doing this, we're also striving to challenge this traditional knowledge hierarchy where academic and theoretical knowledge is seen as superior to practice-based knowledge and experience. So we, we're touching on this and kind of challenging that, that um, binary and hierarchy. Um, so yes, kind of concluding, uh, uh, just to say, while well, combining critical theoretical reflection with empirical data, the volume strives to continuously engage with what this means then for development practice. If SDG 5's target of ending all forms of violence against women is to be achieved, how should actors in the international development sector engage with religion and religious actors? How should they be approached? How do we go into the space? So as such, volume has a decidedly practical dimension. Firmly grounded in theoretical analysis and empirical research, the book unpacks the nature of religion and religious actors in relation to violence against women and girls with the aim of giving greater clarity on how to, and I guess how not to, engage with religion around violence against women and girls. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now I introduce our moderator, Catherine Marshall. Catherine Marshall is a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs, where she leads the center's work on religion and global development. And she's a professor of the practice of development, conflict and religion in the Walsh School of Foreign Service. She helped to create and now serves as the executive director of the World Faith Development Dialogue. She is also the vice president of the G20 Interfaith Association. Just before I turn to Catherine, I also um, would like to remind our audience to put up your questions on the question and answer sections. Catherine, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, and congratulations to all of you on uh, the publication and near publication. Uh, we do have a number of questions that have come in uh, that focus particularly, I think, on the links between the academic um, focus uh, of much of your research and what's actually happening in the world. But I thought it might be useful if, Aisha, first, you could give us a little bit more information about the series. How did it get started? How many how many books are out? I think it's wonderful that they're open access and that they are available. Um, but um, how many do you expect there to be uh, in the end? Uh, and who, whose idea was it, I guess? Actually, I am happy to say that it was, I, I was invited to join this project by my colleagues, Christine and Pauline. They were working on this and they reached out to me. So I would also turn to them to also add to that. And I was uh, honored when they reached out to me. So the idea started uh, two, three years ago when Christine and Pauline were working together at the Princeton University. And the... Um, and we've been talking about issues of SDGs and the role of religion and this lack of relationship between uh, or more constructive, better understanding between different segments of um, policymakers, practitioners and academicians. And how could we come down from our ivory center and do something that is um, less academic in nature, but firmly grounded in the academic theoretical discussions, cutting edge issues and that make it more accessible to wider audiences. So I'm just gonna to turn to Christine and Pauline, if she can join us, uh, to add from their perspective, since they were the ones who invited me initially. So. Okay, and while Christine is uh, talking, and, and let's 
um, keep this short because this could occupy the next two days. Uh, but you also have a question on what you meant by one-sided uh, reconciliation, which of course is an interesting and rather loaded question uh, in the world today. Yes, thank you very much. Very briefly, um, a few uh, additions to how the series came into being. In 2019, I was a resident research fellow at uh, the Center for Theological Inquiry, CTI, in Princeton on a, a group dedicated to working on religion and violence. And in this group, I worked on my own project, Religion uh, in Post-Genocide Rwanda. And there I met Pauline working on religion in Israel's land rights conflict. And uh, then uh, little by little, the idea came into being. And I thought, why don't we turn uh, the book into a series, invite another colleague, uh, preferably from a different um, religious perspective to join and then we were honored to have Philip McDonick join as well as a member of the International uh, Academic Advisory Board. And Ruby, who was also part of the fellowship joined. So little by little, we have reached out and built the networking, built the community. Uh, Elizabeth LaRue was part of the fellowship uh, previously. That's how the whole thing started and um, I'm very happy to see how it develops, how more and more people join in and help us build bridges. As for the question on the one-sided notion of reconciliation that I have observed in uh, some uh, faith actors in Rwanda, I'm referring here to Paul Lederach's concept of reconciliation, which uh, builds on four dimensions, mercy, forgiveness, truth, and justice. And what I have encountered in Rwanda, uh, notwithstanding um, how deeply I'm impressed by the work they do, is that sometimes I feel they are overemphasizing the, over the notions of forgiveness and mercy and perhaps neglecting the dimensions of justice and truth. So this is what I meant by a one-sided notion of reconciliation. Great, thank you. Well, now I think most of the rest of the questions turn around these complex issues of translating or linking the academic uh, with the practical. But let me start with a very practical first question. And I think Philip may be the, the best person to kick off on this, but it is essentially, if the ideas that you're advancing were actually applied, how might that affect one of today's hottest issues, which is the global uh, vaccination challenge and particularly the roles that religious communities and institutions and leaders might play. Mute. The religions have great social capital. So that's maybe one point to make straight off you know, on the ground, if we're talking about hospitals or um, social care, religious communities are very important. And I think a number of international organizations and UN bodies are fully aware of that. But I suppose the more interesting question is the philosophical question, you know, that we have obligations both to our immediate neighbors and to society as a whole. Um, and that includes an obligation to build societies which are capable of taking decisions in the common interest. And then I think another dimension comes in, which is the obligation of one society to another and to the community of states. Um, and so our book is focused to a great extent on that philosophical question, you know, of how governments uh, in terms of trying to, to refine the principles of international cooperation would draw on religious insights. And that, of course, 
was the case. You know, in the Catholic Church, Robert Schumann, who is one of the big figures in the foundation of the European Union, is now being considered as a candidate for beatification, as, as it's called. Um, but I think if you look at other great international initiatives of the past, you'll often see there has been um, a religious dimension. You know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, UN Charter, and so on. I'm not saying that they were written as religious documents, but the depth of cultural sources on which they drew included religion and worldview. And so we're arguing that we have to get back to that in order to be more effective at a global level. Uh, let's take um, Rachel uh, Forster, who has two questions, and I will just read them and see who wants to pick this up, because I think they follow very much from this broad theme. So the first one is, how do you see the role of traditionally secular institutions, such as the EU, the UN, or nation states, uh, that they can play in the inclusion of religious actors in the realization of the SDGs, especially those relating to gender and peace? And then she also asks, how can we support the inclusion and active participation of youth and women in religious communities with regard to the SDGs, but also more generally. Um, this uh, is in a way the, the dual questions of the seat at the table. And as we often say, if you're not at the table, you end up on the menu. So it's first of all, how do you assure that the wisdom and the insight and the practice coming from religious communities are part of the policy making processes, uh, but also given some of the features of religious leadership, shall we say, how do you bring women uh, and youth more, more in meaningful ways into the process? So I'm not sure who to start with. So let's just see, maybe, maybe Ruby, do you want to pick up this question first? Yes, um, thank you. I think it's, um... It's worth mentioning that these institutions have come a long way. And after 75 years, the UN, for instance, is, is, is making a lot of changes, not enough, but a lot of changes to get um, more actors involved. And the SDG, particularly SDG 16, you know, zeroes in on the, the, this notion of participation and inc inclusivity at all levels. And over the last 20 years, especially all UN missions and agencies in all countries make the effort to, um, to connect more with um, local institutions and, and, and you know, st state agencies and so on. I should add though that it's been a slow process to get local actors involved in these um, you know, interstate relationships that is run by the UN. Because at the end of the day, the UN is driven by states. And so it's been a very slow process. But the question that, that was asked is, how, how do we see that playing out? That has already happened. If I take, for instance, in electoral politics, um, in many African countries, the um, religious institutions have played a lead role in maintaining peace, especially during electoral violence. And the United Nations offices, well as the UNDP and so on, have collaborated with those local initiatives um, um, to, to ensure that uh, you know, peace and security is maintained. Um, in other areas like nutrition, in, in like, like um, um, you know, infant mortality, all of these elements, the UN agencies, UNICEF, UNESCO, have, have coll are collaborating with local actors. Is that enough? No, it isn't enough because, um, because traditionally, these, what, what the question I call the secular institutions, um, are used to working in a certain top-down way. And so we're still struggling to get a more kind of bottom-up approach to, to development and, and and, and that is still a struggle. For youth and, and, and women, I think a lot of the UN um, protocols and, 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 and resolutions have now been put in place in ways that create the framework 
for, for women and children to be included. Um, recently, and it's still ongoing, the Youth and Peace and Security um, um, Act is, is beginning to take shape in many countries. So people are beginning to put efforts into youth programs. Um, if you go down to, to, to Sudan, to Somaliland, places that are not even recognized um, by the international community, youth programs are flourishing and the UN and UN agencies and other and similar agencies are beginning to see the, the fruits of that. It would require a lot more because it has a lot to do with financing these programs and, and and if international NGOs and international institutions are not putting in money it's going to be a problem to sustain those and so and, and to end this is why we need to focus on locally driven locally owned processes and possibly locally funded in, in the years to come thanks yeah you've emphasized an important global theme which also applies very much to these religious challenges, which is the localization agenda, the balance between the transnational and what actually happens. I'm going to turn to Elizabeth, but um, there are two other questions that are sort of, a, as I read them, along similar lines. Uh, the first one from Holly Gainsley. Um, interesting from an academic perspective, but how does this reach and apply to the general public which is drifting from the belief that religion can bring positive change. So the sort of global skepticism and from Leslie Cosgrove, how does the difference between independent religious institutions and state government regulated religious institutions impact religious ability to participate and interact with the SDGs and global development? So, so some challenges from two quite different directions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I kind of have it up on the screen so that I can keep my focus. So um, in response to Holly's question around, um, you know, what about the general public who doesn't really believe in the influence of religion anymore or is starting to believe in it less? Um, I guess I need to emphasize that that what we're drawing on is from countries and settings with higher religiosity. So I'm a Global South scholar working predominantly in the Global South. So that is a reality in the spaces where I work and live and do research. Um, in reflecting more on, on predominantly Global North settings where that might not be the case, I think, to put it maybe a bit bluntly, I think people sometimes uh, misunderstand or, uh, or, or do not give full credit maybe to the role of religion, even in what is seen as, as, as secular societies or even post-secular societies. I, I um, maybe, maybe to leave it at that point, I, 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 don't think the role of religion and religious organizations, even in, in, in more secular uh, states, um, is as negligible as some people might think, especially in terms of the role of, of leaders and the space and authority and platform that religious leaders still have, even, even though people in general see themselves as more agnostic or atheist. Um, so if that answers your question, Holly, to move on to what Leslie asked, I think this is a fa fascinating question, and it is so different depending on the setting. Um, and my reflection is, is colored by my work around gender equality and, and, and violence against women and girls. Um, first of all, where, where there's state and government regulated religious institutions, one of the things that we see is quite problematic is um, your work with religious spaces, religious communities um, is then limited very often to just working with that state, state sanctioned religious community. So it is much harder very often to engage with minority religious groups. Um, so, so, so access to independent religious institutions where there is state regulated um, religious institutions is more difficult. At the same time, um, where, where 
we, we have government regulated religious institutions very often for high level organizations like UN and EU organ, um, interventions and, and, and offices. There is a more, there is a clearer road uh, to enter religious spaces and to engage with religious communities. And so there's potential in that as, as well. Um, the, the challenge very much, and, and this is just based on my own work with, with different organizations, is where you are introducing ideas and, and concepts that challenge um, the status quo, um, where it is a state-regulated uh, religion, it's much more difficult to have those conversations and to try and bring that transformation. Um, it's easier in spaces where, where, uh, where it's not a very tight link between a religious group and, and, and state. Um, so, so like instinctively, if I'm looking for an easy space to work, I, I would not want that connection because there's just more room for engagement and, and potential transformation. Um, yes, I, I think I think that's my answer. Thank you. Great. Well, we have uh, a lot of very interesting questions coming in, and I don't think in the time we're going to be able to do full justice. But let me at least try to pick out a couple of themes and throw them um, perhaps to Christine and Philip first. Um, the first one is, what do you do uh, in situations of where reconciliation is may, perhaps not high on the agenda of the involved parties to get the process started. So that's one question. Then a second one from Metropolitan uh, Kikotis from Zimbabwe and Angola. He's putting a couple of the hot issues of the moment on, uh, on our agenda that I don't think I heard mentioned. One is the dealing with debt issues and some of Obviously, debt takes you into the sort of overall economic frameworks, um, but in also also the issue of corruption, where at least in theory, religious actors one would hope would be very actively involved. So maybe we can stick with those two, and then after that, I'll I'll turn. To Aisha had her hand up, so and she also wanted to respond. I think to another question below. So. Let's maybe quickly, Christine, and then Philip. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll start with the first question. How do you get reconciliation started if, um, if it is not on the agenda, if people are not willing? Um, that is actually a tricky one. I think if people are not willing um, to engage in reconciliation, reconciliation is a, is a concept of relationship. You need to two parties to engage in reconciliation. And that is what makes it different from forgiveness. Forgiveness uh, needs one person. Um, that doesn't work for reconciliation. How can one uh, try to, uh, to encourage, uh, to get the process started? Well, I think there are multiple historical examples where reconciliation did not happen and where uh, engagement with the past, with stereotypes, with memory, um, all these things that are, that are related to uh, reconciliation processes, where this does not uh, where this did not take place and where years, decades, or even centuries later, uh, these old uh, enmities were again surfacing um, and overshadowing the present. So I think that would be an entrance point to engage in reconciliation. Also, a, a field that has been recently attracting a lot of attention is the area of transgenerational trauma. If that is not addressed, if reconciliation does not happen, then this trauma is being passed on to the next or even the next uh, generation after that. Sometimes you can see that in Germany where we now have the third generation after the Holocaust um, where uh, trauma goes way back and if it has never been addressed, um, it impacts the way people live today. Philip, do you want to pick up some of these questions? There's also another one to address to you 
uh, building on your notion of workable frameworks? Well, um, of course, reconciliation is a very important concept in on the island of Ireland and in these islands, because we have the Northern Ireland peace process, which has achieved a great deal. But many people would say that reconciliation hasn't really followed as we had hoped. So I think what, what you can do is you can have um, reasonable ground rules, which can be negotiated. Uh, you can work together as much as possible, developing common interests. Um, but in the end, reconciliation is given. And I think that given, I mean, it's a, it's a grace in religious terms. And I think there's a wider lesson there. And this is one of the ways in which religion can illuminate politics, that we're not actually in control. Uh, we can take steps and we must take steps. But in the end, some of the results that we're looking for are beyond our control. And even in the case of the pandemic, we see that. On the other question, I, I think the question about debt and corruption is extremely relevant because I think money is a subject that we often walk past without considering how money shapes our world in all sorts of ways. Um, it shapes our ethics in all sorts of ways. Um, it's very often connected with a highly individualistic um, morality. Um, the history of conflict is very often tied up with financial and economic interests and so on and so on. And that's very much what I was trying to point towards in, in arguing that we need frameworks where the most consequential issues are addressed. We need much more focus on money or to use an old fashioned word, usury, in, in as we approach global issues, because it's such an important factor. It's a driver of inequality and so on. Um, so maybe that answer also covers the question about frameworks. You know, I think we need frameworks in which we actually have the courage to define the unresolved issues of our time and begin to address them. You know, and we can live with imperfection for a very long time. That's mercy and forgiveness. Uh, that means we, we do forgive one another for living in compromised circumstances, but we don't ignore the issue. Good, well, that's a, a wonderful start. And we have other questions that are coming in that are essentially broadening the scope to the whole question of how both the humanitarian and the development and the conflict resolution all are working to bring more, in more meaningful ways, the complexity of religious ideas and actors in. So now let's turn to Aisha. I guess part of what you'll do is to uh, address the specific questions about the series. And I think maybe that's an opportunity to, to set the series in that broader context. Yes, also I'd like to respond to some of the questions about Good. women and religion in particular within the context of Muslim communities. My piece in the first volume, uh, the role of religion and conflict and uh, conflict resolution focused on looking at the role of Muslim women peace builders. It is true that in many occasions, religion is associated with backwardness and especially in the context where Muslim societies are involved, um, Muslim women are always perceived to be in need of saving. But in reality, I, my experience is that it's on the contrary. There's so many Muslim women and uh, women of faith are actually doing a lot of this work. And uh, it's part, well, there was a comment about the role of interpretation, et cetera. So um, in my experience, uh, international organizations and communities, they have focused on women, but they have ignored women of faith in particular. And uh, Berkeley Center with Catherine Marshall and uh, Susie Hayward, uh, they wrote a book about this and uh, on the role of woman, religion, and faith. And uh, what we have experienced is that while there's a lot of work on religion and peace building that involves religious leaders, which tends to be mass males, and the woman issues and peace, which includes mostly secular women, the woman of faith has been one of the groups that has been excluded the most. But I, in my experience, in my research that I've been focusing on the last few years, uh, I've seen that women of faith has unique strengths that are not available to religious men. 
male leaders, as well as secular women, with access to the communities, the groups, the legitimacy and credibility that they may have um, within their context, but also the issues that they prefer to address. They may not always have the power in the traditional sense, but in the book, Catherine Marshall's book, we talk about the issue of strategic invisibility. This does not mean that they're powerless. There's so many ways. And in my own experience, one of the projects I'm most recently working on is uh, Islam and uh, world of women, looking at the Quran and the text. Many women are uncovering the gender justice issues within the Islamic context. So there's so much is going on, but we what we have to do, in my opinion, in, is that we have to give voice and space to women of faith rather than ignoring them. Don't We, we have been letting the secular women's voices represent them. So we have to have a more intersectional approach that sees the, excuse me, the contribution of women of faith from all different traditions as an equal, respectable voice and ask them what are some of the ways that they can contribute? What are some of the unique ways that they have been working and successfully doing some research and evaluation of the kind of effective works that they have been doing and highlighting and emphasizing those. So I just wanted to add that. But also going back to the, um, the series, we have two published volumes already. That was one of the first questions you asked, Catherine, I forgot to mention. And the first one is on the role of religion in conflict and conflict resolution. The second that published one is the Phillips book on the role of religion in global policy. The next two ones that are in the works being published, coming out is Elizabeth and Ruby's uh, works. But after that, we have plans for at least 10 more books um, approximately, that is in the works of being designed. They have not started being sort of uh, written or some of them are just starting to be written, but that, uh, so we are trying to sort of um, have more general books like the book on um, SDGs, which is an introductory volume that would be more comprehensive, more holistic and would address the role of religion in a broader introductory way. But we're also trying to address different SGDs, uh, SDGs uh, within the volume looking at this ambivalence of religion, both the constructive role and the, the role uh, in terms of how it contributes some of the problems out there. So we're trying to be nuanced and um, without ignoring um, the problems, but also highlighting the constructive role religion can play in all of these issues. Thank you. Well, we're coming very close to the end. But, uh, we have seven minutes by my calculation. But Aisha, before I let you go, I think I'd better we throw to you um, Farid Shaikh's uh, question, which is how can we include many Muslim scholars, uh, faith groups in Muslim my majority countries that are quote, totally against gender equality. They vehemently oppose women education uh, and jobs and many religious leaders are also against the COVID-19 vaccination program. So I, I think you've already addressed that, but perhaps you might have just a few words. And then I think what we'll do is to ask each of the panelists to have a final minute of the messages you'd like to see people take away or possibly the questions that you have that, um, that keep you awake at night. Just very quickly to respond to its question. Um, yes, there are so many um, Muslim scholars, mostly males, who are against women taking more um, roles in education and jobs. But one of the things, one of the approaches that we're doing is we're engaging with the prophetic tradition, as well as the Quran itself, which are the important legitimate sources for Muslims. So for example, the Quran provides examples of women from uh, political leaders such as the Queen of Shaba to Prophet's own examples of education of women and women uh, uh, in various different um, professions within the time of the Prophet. So I think for many of these uh, leaders, when we engage them, which we do, um, their excuse or their sort of explanation is not religious, but they reach out to the issue of security. Oh, we don't want women to be educated because the school, sending girls to the schools is not secure. Or we don't want women to be employed in these contexts. It's not the time, like the prophet's time, because it's not secure. So we work in constructive ways in addressing their issues, but also engaging them from the legitimate sources that they cannot deny is there has been much more effective, so. Good. And I, I do note the first 
question we had, which is actually a comment, is the distinction, that subtle and important distinction between interpretations of religion and essence of religion. Uh, so let's give each of you your minute. So starting with Christine and then on to Ruby. Religion matters. In order to deal with the challenges that we as world community face today, we need to increase our religious literacy and become aware not only of religion's destructive forces, but even more so of religion's powerful, constructive resources. And how to do that, how to better include these constructive resources in a more comprehensive way, this is the question that keeps me awake at night. Ruby. Right on the, um, right in on that is um, the question that a lot of people have asked in the chat is how do we do this? Our volume is on the how question. A lot of religious groups, a lot of people are looking for spaces to engage. How do religious groups engage institutions, governments, and so on? Um, we need to get back to the deliberative spaces in which we speak. And cultures around the world have indigenous ways of talking. We need to shore that up in our religious groups. And in our volume, we are um, showcasing African traditional religion, um, showing the case of the United States, which as you know, religion forms part of the politics, as well as the South Pacific small island countries. And we've chosen these places as um, terrains where religion matters to people. And they cannot engage the politics of the day without bringing the overall identity, which includes religion. So if we're gonna move forward, we need to find spaces for religion to interact with the politics and deliberative conversational collaborative spaces are the way to go. Thanks. Philip and then Elizabeth. Mute. The issue I'd be most interested in developing is this question of frameworks, workable frameworks, which the questioner mentioned. Uh, in our book, as an epilogue, we have a quite detailed description of a potential multilateral framework modeled on the former CSCE process. And that's on a grand scale. But then on a smaller scale, we in Ireland had citizens assemblies, which are carefully organized groups, focus groups, if you like. And um, the European Union is experimenting with some new formats, such as a, a huge web platform for the Conference on the Future of Europe. The churches themselves are experimenting by commissioning work from experts. Uh, this is happening in the island of Ireland um, and so on. But I think that the question of the frameworks and the rules of engagement uh, for bringing in this voice uh, of depth, uh, that's the great question we face. I think there's a huge openness, but how to do it is the question. Elizabeth? Um, I'm much tickled by this idea of what keeps me up at night. Sorry, this is my cat. Um, what keeps me up at night is finding that balance between recognizing the urgency of the issue and that immediate need to respond and balancing that with the reality that if you, if you want to bring constructive, transformative change to beliefs and behaviors, um, you need a process of I think we get pushed and pulled between those two viewpoints with, with big international multilaterals demanding hard and fast rules and, and no compromise and immediate action versus small local organizations saying, if you want to work in this space, it needs to go slow and, and we need to start where people are. Um, and that's what I find very challenging and, and that keeps me up at night. Um, how to how to negotiate that. Aisha, do you have a, a final word? And I do need to thank you particularly for your persistence in bringing a complex set of topics and people together. 
Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity and to our panelists and to you, Catherine, and all the um, staff that helped us put this together and to our audience. Thank you for these wonderful questions and um, love to continue our chat afterwards. If you have any, my email should be on the website, I think. And um, so thank you. Great. Well, I think that there are a number of threads here that all of us will want to pursue and, and personal context, but also pursuing some of the ideas and challenges that you have put out. And we look forward to uh, reading the whole series uh, beyond those that are already uh, available. So to remind you, this was recorded. The recording will be on the website and you'll receive it. Uh, we are uh, saving the questions. We always save the questions and we'll um, reflect on them. And um, I think that we'll send them along with some of the resources that have been mentioned uh, during this discussion. So with that, thank you all very much and have a good, a good week.